Welcome to You versus You, part three of two. We're talking about the essential, indivisible, fundamental you that is within your mind, within your body, within your memories, however you, however you care to put it. And we have a diagram which reveals the truth of the exist of the <clears throat> a diagram which reveals the truth of this existence so where does this diagram come from years ago i wrote a full length book about the mind defining it and i defined it on the basis of three dimensions so the three dimensions that I chose to use, it could be any three, you could choose a different three if you felt you needed to, but the three dimensions that I felt were, were the best choice were goodness, truth, and chance or fate. So truth is the basis of the intellectual side of the mind, goodness is the basis of the emotional side of the mind, and truth or fate is the basis of the what I call what what in psychological terms has most recently been called the parental side of the mind, as in parent adult child, the the transactional analysis theory, the transactional analysis theory, which goes back through Freud, three dimensions of mind, back to 400 A.D. the Council of Ni don't know how you pronounce it, Nicaea, Nicaea, Nicaea is how it's spelt, which ratified the Holy Trinity and the great debate was which came first, which of these three dimensions came first, because of course there wasn't, there wasn't the same uh, wealth of uh, background information that there is now to go with this understanding. So, I've written my book and I've developed this theory as far as I can take it. And the book is full of diagrams, which all of which are colour coded because the colours mean something. So yellow, blue, uh, <coughs> red corresponds to these, the, what we, emotionally feel is the nature of these three dimensions which make up not a mind set but a mind space. And to nobody's greater surprise than to mine where we end up after all of this work at the end of it is we end up with a new colour and the new colour is just as meaningful, just as exact, just as logically uh, appropriate and true as the other three colours. So where, is, so where it's utterly right and proper to use red for the emotional child and blue for the intellectual logical adult and I believe yellow for the happy uh, happy-go-lucky uh, parent, um, green represents the, the inexperienced new you. The, the natural you that has an existence completely separate from the natural me, the natural somebody else, not just now when we're physically separated, but later on when we're spiritually separated, although we end up in the same place. And the three dimensions or three components, as it's generally termed in psychology, have just as much significance to the inner 
essential you as to the individual components of you. So we can split, we can represent the, the, the singular you, we can represent that in three different ways and we can, we can gain an insight by doing so. So for example, the essential you that is that that is that is the part of you that is within that with that is measured by that child dimension that dimension of goodness that part of you is uh expanded and triggered by typically alcohol in the modern in in modern life uh cigarettes as an alternative um, and although these drastically reduce your cognitive and intellectual um, capability, they greatly increase your confidence, your sociability, your uh, verbal, um, your desire to, uh, to, to communicate. So these are, it, it, it's self-evident that these are elements which the child, which the, which the child component is most engaged by and most engaged in. So we are, some of us particularly, are very good at using alcohol to reward ourselves. We spend a lot of time working very hard. We spend a lot of time waiting, if you like, for the chance, the, an appropriate situation to, un, to, to just uncork a beer, uncork a bottle of wine, um, whatever your tipple of choice is and whatever your pre preferred social situation is. We are very good at making that into a reward independent of how much it co of how much money it costs how available it is we we um, become skilled at managing ourselves by by the uh, by the uh, appropriate um, rewarding of ourselves more difficult is the adult but no less clear cut so there is a, the you, <coughs> the fundamental essential you that is an in, that 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 has an intellectual life. The don't want to muddy the waters by using inappropriate by using terms that have the wrong uh, connotation. The fundamental essential component or dimension of you that is intellectual rather than just emotional, that is logical and, and, and essential to both fairness and happiness, that part of you is a hand in a glove in terms of your cognitive mind it's very very it's impossible to it's 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 not impossible it's such a fine line between you and the cognitive elements of your mind that are not you it's such a fine line there is it, it, it it's almost unthinkable to come between them however you'll know if you if you if you've observed yourself falling asleep or coming awake, you'll know that there's a difference between the fundamental you and your memories. When you go to sleep, you forget who you are. You, in your dreams, you don't have an identity by name. You don't have a physical appearance. You have 
uh, a metaphysical identity, a metaphysical appearance that could be that could take many different shapes. When you when you come awake, it takes a what it takes a minute or two to remember who you are, and in some ways it comes as a slight surprise that you are anybody at all. You you wake up and you think, oh yeah, that's that's who I am today. That's what I'm doing today. But as you get further down the path of life, that happens to you in so many different situations. In some ways, it's a little bit of a surprise to find yourself in the same place for any length of time. So this component is a hand in a glove and you can't separate the hand from the glove. It's that snug and tighter fit. Except you can when you go to sleep, you can when you wake up. And of course, the other key way you can is hypnosis. So this weird situation where the inner you becomes exposed and suggestible in a way that it normally never would be. So you, it, in effect, a person who's hypnotized is, beha is behaving as they would if they were in another mind. So if you were um, operating uh, your cognitive uh, abilities, your cognitive skills, your co cognitive experiences, but as part of the conscience in somebody else's mind, as other ancestors and so, so on and so forth are doing for you right now and for me, then then you would no longer you would not be in charge you would not be in sole charge of that mind you would be you would need to be suggestible because it would you would be you would be a pipeline in that mind things would be suggested to you and you would suggest things on based on your cognitive understanding without any notion of of even having of, e of even what an identity is let alone having one yourself so that's how hypnosis works, and that's how the logic of hypnosis works. And it's not, when I say suggestible, I mean within the, within the, uh, within the context of the conscience. So yes, you're, uh, when you're hypnotized, you're suggestible, but that doesn't mean you're going to do things that are fundamentally against your nature. If you're asked to do something which is fundamentally you know to be wrong, you're not only not going to do it, you're probably going to wake up out of your trance state. If you're unknowingly tricked in some way, if you're unknowingly humiliated or... or, or, or or something like that, if it, although although that may happen at the time, you may you may waddle like a duck in in public and, and everybody may laugh at you. Although that may ha that 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 may be successful at the time, there is a legacy that goes with that. You, the essential you, is not going to shrug that off and forget about it. And there's, inf there's uh, evidence um, from people's testimonies that that's exactly what's happened. They've, they've, had, uh, they've been uh, mentally robbed by, by this um, humiliation while under hypnosis and they resent it and they're not happy, not happy about it and they, they struggle and suffer as a result. So that's not right and it's obviously not right. Another interesting thing about uh, about uh, this uh, this side by comparison with this side is that whereas uh, alcohol and uh, cigarettes are particularly appropriate for ways of managing limited 
ways of managing rewards under limited circumstances. Food's another example. Uh, if you directly want to address um, uh, person, if, if, if you directly want to address the cognitive functioning of the mind, so for example, because of a PTSD situation, which may happen as a result of known external circumstances, or might happen as a result of forgotten external circumstances, and so might be doubly inaccessible because not only do you not know what was the cause of the problem, you don't really know why it's had the effect it's had. But there's again further evidence that again drugs are, are potentially helpful with, with this and not just chemical drugs, not just, you know, um, not just the sort of sledgehammer of chemicals that do all sorts of damage to your physiology, but natural drugs like, like magic mushrooms. And one of the things that I've kind of, one of the things I'm very, very keen to reward myself with, because I want to reward this side as well as, and not just this side, one of the things I want to do is at a certain point in my life, I want to take a, I want to take a proper psychedelic trip. So that's two out of three. And the third component, the, uh, the, parent, the parent component, which is the component of uh, self-knowledge and knowledge of others. So this is, this is much less uh, pure logic and much less pure emotion. This is uh, much more experience and uh, judgment and fairness. And what we see, where we see evidence for this fundamental, um, un, in, indestructible, uh, infinite uh, everlasting you, where we see evidence for that, is acting. So when somebody is driven to act, when they're driven to uh, exhibit a personality that is actually not their own personality, and they're able to do it, and they're able to do it in, in, in the way that it becomes an art form, then that person is really using a skill that they've got that is nothing to do with the skill of of, of logical, clear thinking, or the skill of spontaneous, natural, creative being. So that's a little explanation of what the you that I'm talking about here is. And what is uh, challenging about this is to distinguish between the you that is me and the you that is plural. So you versus you or in this case, part three of two, ye versus thou. Thou versus ye. Only Quakers and the mighty Thor 
I've ever used the word thou in my experience. <clears throat> I understand from the internet that thou and ye were the singular and plural honorific for something like this picture. But I have here the London Review of Books dated 3rd of July 2020, which is about a week and a half from when I'm filming this. And the top line advertises the article, How Should I Refer to You? by Amir Srinivasan, an academic. And it reminds us that there isn't a word for what this picture represents. The example that the article uses is, how do you complete the following sentence? Everyone misplaces blank keys. There is no way to do so that is both uncontroversially grammatical and generally liked. It's a lovely article, this. Some really nice writing of non-fiction, as we'll see. <coughs> I hope. Most people, even those who as a rule don't like it, will be pulled towards the singular they. Everyone misplaces their keys. The problem with their is that pronouns should agree with their subjects in both gender and number. Their is fine on the first count because everyone is genderless but fails on the second, since everyone is grammatically speaking singular and they is plural. So this is an article discussing how I would refer to a third person without using their gender, without having to define their gender, he or she, because this is a genderless diagram. The closest thing to it is the word one. Everyone misplaces one's keys. This is grammatical because one agrees in both gender and number with everyone. But for centuries, one has been considered too stuffy by language experts and users alike, especially in the US. The pomposity of one is in part an effect of its monotonous. And this is a lovely, this is, this is beautifully put. The pomposity of one is in part an effect of its monotonous pattern of declension. Example, one subject, one object, one's possessive, oneself reflexive. By the way, this is all news to me. So I don't think this is general knowledge by any, by any, by any, by any case, but it is kind of um, one doesn't need to have the training to recognise the truth. She continues, this means that one who uses one is liable to use one one too many, as in one does one's best to do one's homework by oneself. <coughs> yes.
the French example on is much more successful, as the article goes on to say. And there are many, many examples, which is what the body of the article is about, of where people have tried to come up with a genderless suitable pronoun. I particularly like this observation. In Turkish, the equivalent of he, she and it is simply o, oh, which seems to me unimprovable. <laughs> That's beautifully put. Uh, it seems to me unimprovable as well. There is one suggestion which I've kind of used in the past, which doesn't appear in the article which is that when I've been writing about my metaphysical uh, ideas, my, my, my favourite subject, um, I've occasionally had the need to refer to humankind as a whole. Um, and my, <clears throat> my training, the word for that is mankind. So... How do I refer to mankind as a whole? Well, I've tended to, um, I've tended to change in recent years to humankind, but then rather than fussing, I've tended to refer to humankind as he, but I've tended to refer to it with a capital H in the in the in the pronoun, uh, thereby highlighting, I hope that he is not gendered because it's it's capitalized and that seems to me to follow on from uh, how historically we've talked about god which it's very unfashionable to talk about these days but i think that there's a there's a sense in which this uh picture is a is a is a picture not just of something human but also of something divine, and therefore I would be happy to see the capitalised he or she, it's completely one's choice which one to use, I wouldn't say one over the other, but certainly capitalised in usage to identify the fact that it refers to a genderless individual. Of course, what this article is really about is the modern arrival of non-binary, trans, <coughs> and an entire um, activist element which says you can talk about you, you can talk about they, you can talk about How can I put it? You can talk about you, you can talk about your group, you can talk about your world, but you can't talk about me. You can't tell me what I am. I guess it's the corollary of a theory of mind, which is a theory that the individual isn't really, isn't really subject to theory. So for everybody who says, yes, this is a theory of every everybody, not just, well, this is a theory of everybody and everything, not just people, but aliens, animals, you know, it's a, it's a theory, it's, it's a model, it's a model for understanding the principle of mind on a universal 
basis. However, that's not to say that one is reduced to a, a formula or worse, an automaton. Um, it's not to say one, one can be dehumanised by a theory of everyone and everything. And it's important that that is recognised overtly, um, politically, if you like. And that's why the article is timely. And that's why the London Review has published it. I would say this diagram applies to everybody and is not gendered, because I would say that how it how I would say that how gender is reflected in this diagram is simply stated, as it turns out. I would say that. Uh, I would say that the, the fundamental essential you, singular, is both simultaneously at the centre and at the edge of this diagram. And that's how you, although nothing, although not different in essence to the elements of mind, that's how you are in charge of your own mind. You obviously don't move in the sense of, um, in the sense of, um, you obviously don't move from the centre, but one way to think about how the mind works, how the mind operates, is to see yourself as moving around um, the, the, the circle so that one transitions from one component to the next component. And, and this, is, this is traditionally the fundamental insight of psychology. So these ego, the, sorry, these components are not traditionally seen as dimensions because mind has not traditionally been seen as a space. These components are traditionally seen as traditionally talked of as being ego states that one moves between. So rather than moving in space, one moves around. And that's a, that's that's a, a very useful aspect of this diagram that it exactly describes gender roles because and 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 the cultural nature of gender because what we would say and i would say that it applies i would i would say that it works uh not just for humans but for uh, for animals as well who also pair bond i would say that the natural ego transitions, the natural way of moving around the outside of the circle, the natural way of moving in space, in, in mind space, is for males to go from, to, to basically take the adult, the, the intellectual, the intellectual uh, rational component as the source and to go from the adult to the child or from the adult to the parent. Whereas for the whereas for females, the natural uh, source is the child is uh, and is fundamentally goodness. And so the source for 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 train trains of thought, circles of thought is to start from the child and end up at the child, whereas for for males it's to start from the adult and end up at the adult. So the direction, <laughs> the direction of rotation is the same in both cases, but the starting point isn't. And that I think is how I, over the balance of time and over the 
the course of con consideration, that is how I fundamentally understand gender difference. And I would say that that is a, as, as much uh, a cultural difference as it, is, as it is a natural difference, because although it seems odd to talk about it, I think it is on balance a uh, hundred percent observable that uh, animal life has is 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 acculturated and that includes human life Thou versus ye. Only Quakers and the mighty Thor have ever used the word thou in my experience. <clears throat> I understand from the internet that thou and ye were the singular and plural honorific for something like this picture. But I have here the London Review of Books, dated 3rd of July 2020, which is about a week and a half from when I'm filming this, and the top line advertises the article, How Should I Refer to You? by Amir Srinivasan, an academic, and it reminds us that there isn't a word for what this picture represents. The example that the article uses is, how do you complete the following sentence? Everyone misplaces blank keys. There is no way to do so that is both uncontroversially grammatical and generally liked. It's a lovely article, this. Some really nice writing of non-fiction, as we'll see. <coughs> I hope. Most people, even those who as a rule don't like it, will be pulled towards the singular they. Everyone misplaces their keys. The problem with their is that pronouns should agree with their subjects in both gender and number. Their is fine on the first count because everyone is genderless but fails on the second, since everyone is grammatically speaking singular and they is plural. So this is an article discussing how I would refer to a third person without using their gender, without having to define their gender, he or she, because this is a genderless diagram.
The closest thing to it is the word one. Everyone misplaces one's keys. This is grammatical because one agrees in both gender and number with everyone. But for centuries, one has been considered too stuffy by language experts and users alike, especially in the US. The pomposity of one is in part an effect of its monotonous. And this is a lovely, this is, this is beautifully put. The pomposity of one is in part an effect of its monotonous pattern of declension. Example, one subject, one object, one's possessive, oneself reflexive. By the way, this is all news to me. So I don't think this is general knowledge by any, by any, by any, by any case, but it is kind of, um, one doesn't need to have the training to recognise the truth. She continues, this means that one who uses one is liable to use one one too many, as in, one does one's best to do one's homework by oneself. <clears throat> yes. The French example on is much more successful, as the article goes on to say, and there are many, many examples, which is what the body of the article is about, of where people have tried to come up with a genderless suitable pronoun. I particularly liked this observation. In Turkish, the equivalent of he, she and it is simply o, oh, which seems to me unimprovable. <laughs> That's beautifully put. Uh, it seems to me unimprovable as well. There is one suggestion which I've kind of used in the past, which doesn't appear in the article which is that when I've been writing about my metaphysical uh, ideas, my, my, my favourite subject, um, I've occasionally had the need to refer to humankind as a whole. Um, and my, <clears throat> my training, the word for that is mankind. So how do I refer to mankind as a whole? Well, I've tended to, um, I've tended to change in recent years to humankind, but then rather than fussing, I've tended to refer to humankind as he, but I've tended to refer to it with a capital H in the, in the, in the pronoun, uh, thereby highlighting, I hope, that he is not gendered because it's it's capitalized and that seems to me to follow on from uh, how historically we've talked about god which it's very unfashionable to talk about these days but i think that there's a there's a sense in which this uh picture is a is a is a picture not just of something human but also of something divine, and therefore I would be happy to see the capitalised he or she, it's completely one's choice which one to use, I wouldn't say one over the other, but certainly capitalised in usage to identify the fact that it refers to a genderless individual.
Of course, what this article is really about is the modern arrival of non-binary, trans, <coughs> and an entire um, activist element which says you can talk about you, you can talk about they, you can talk about how can I put it? You can talk about you, you can talk about your group, you can talk about your world, but you can't talk about me. You can't tell me what I am. I guess it's the corollary of a theory of mind, which is a theory that the individual isn't really, isn't really subject to theory. So for everybody who says, yes, this is a theory of every everybody, not just, well, this is a theory of everybody and everything, not just people, but aliens, animals, you know, it's a, it's a theory, it's, it's a model, it's a model for understanding the principle of mind on a universal basis. However, that's not to say that one is reduced to a, a formula or worse, an automaton. Um, it's not to say one, one can be dehumanised by a theory of everyone and everything. And it's important that that is recognised overtly, um, politically, if you like. And that's why the article is timely. And that's why the London Review has published it. I would say this diagram applies to everybody and is not gendered, because I would say that how it how I would say that how gender is reflected in this diagram is simply stated, as it turns out. I would say that. Uh, I would say that the, the fundamental, essential you, singular, is both simultaneously at the centre and at the edge of this diagram. And that's how you, although nothing, although not different in essence to the elements of mind, that's how you are in charge of your own mind. You obviously don't move in the sense of, um, in the sense of, um, you obviously don't move from the centre, but one way to think about how the mind works, how the mind operates, is to see yourself as moving around um, the, the, the circle so that one transitions from one component to the next component. And, and this, is, this is traditionally the fundamental insight of psychology. So these ego, the, sorry, these components are not traditionally seen as dimensions because mind has not traditionally been seen as a space. These components are traditionally seen as traditionally talked of as being ego states that one moves between. So rather than moving in space, one moves around. And that's a, that's that's uh, a very useful aspect of this diagram that it exactly describes gender roles because and 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 the cultural nature of gender because what we would say and i would say that it applies i would i would say that it works uh not just for humans but for uh, for animals as well who also pair bond, I would say that the natural ego 
transitions, the natural way of moving around the outside of the circle, the natural way of moving in space, in, in mind space, is for males to go from, to, to basically take the adult, the, the intellectual, the intellectual uh, rational component as the source and to go from the adult to the child or from the adult to the parent. Whereas for the, whereas for females, the natural uh, source is the child, is, uh, and is fundamentally goodness. And so the source for, 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 for train, trains of thought, circles of thought, is to start from the child and end up at the child. Whereas for, for males, it's to start from the adult and end up at the adult. So the direction, <laughs> the direction of rotation is the same in both cases, but the starting point isn't. And that, I think, is how I, over the balance of time and over the, the course of con consideration, that is how I fundamentally understand gender difference. And I would say that that is a, as, as much uh, a cultural difference as it, is, as it is a natural difference because although it seems odd to talk about it, I think it is on balance 100% uh, observable that uh, animal life has, is, is, is acculturated and that includes human life.